Beautiful, okay. Now I, I get to introduce our next guest, Adriana Galvan, um, who I'm actually a big fan of, so I'm excited to introduce her. She is a professor of psychology and the Dean of Undergraduate Education at the University of California, Los Angeles. She is also the co-executive director of the UCLA Center for the Developing Adolescent. As a neuroscientist, her career has been focused on adolescent brain development and how it supports de developmental milestones during that significant window. Her research characterizes the neural mechanisms underlying adolescent behavior to inform policies that impact young people. Please give a warm welcome to Adriana Galvan from UCLA. Woo! Thank you. Do I get a microphone? Yes. Okay, I get a microphone, okay. Ah, thank you very much. Wonderful, it is an honor to be here with all of you here today. All of us in this room are here today in our capacities as change makers. Whether you are a young person who is gonna offer lived experience and provide insights about how that can impact our policies, or hear from a federal agency tasked with a very important job of creating and implementing policies that impact young people. We are here because we are interested in bridging a conversation between systems and science and the lived experience. I am here in my capacity as a neuroscientist. I've spent the past 20 years examining and conducting research on adolescent brain development. And we've learned a lot in that time. We've learned that the brain continues to develop during adolescence, that it is highly plastic, but most importantly, we've learned that it doesn't develop in isolation, that the systems and the environment in which it grows um, contributes to the development of that person. But we have some work to do in terms of translating that research into um, policies that impact young people. Adolescence is defined as a period of life between childhood and adulthood. It spans over 15 years. It starts around 10 or 11 or 12 when puberty kicks in and endures through the early to mid 20s. It's no coincidence that we have such a protracted period of development in our species. We need that extra time for our brains to develop and to grow in response to the environment in which it is growing. We, learn, we have learned from the science that development and growth isn't just a product of, of the now, but it is a product of the past, the present, and the future. That our developmental history, that is things that we experienced when we were younger, impact who we are as youth. And as youth, the activities we engage in, the connections that we make, the way that we are treated, all set us up for the future. All of us are here today because we recognize that honoring young people for, for, for the purpose of setting them up for the future is important. But also, we need to acknowledge the power of young people, as we saw in this, in this panel just now, for cultivating strong communities. Although there are 65.5 million young people in the United States today, we have not done and kept pace with the ways that we treat um, older and younger people in all of our systems. This quote nicely illustrates that point. It says, a modern healthcare system without a focus on, pedi on the challenges of pediatrics or geriatrics would be unthinkable, yet there is no similar effort on behalf of young people or adolescents. And clearly this quote focuses on healthcare, but it is relevant to all the systems that we're talking about or will talk about today, whether it's education or juvenile justice or workforce development or foster care. All of these systems perhaps can do a better job at thinking about the unique needs and challenges of this period of development. And we're fortunate that we have these systems represented in the room today. So we can come together to think about how these systems together can support the whole person, holistically support young people during this phase of development and growth. We've done a good job of, at establishing that there are particular developmental needs that occur early in life. When a baby is born, there are certain developmental milestones that we know they will reach, how to learn how to walk and talk and bond with caregivers. But the brain that supports all of these goals um, does so because it is highly plastic. That means that the brain is receptive to the environment and will learn these skills based on the inputs it receives. For example, we all learn a particular language or a set of languages because our parents speak that language to us. And that happens because the brain can respond and learn to become a, a native speaker in that particular language. 
As we grow from being a child into adolescence, we continue to have developmental goals. And importantly, the systems in the environment that set the, the, the appropriate conditions to meet those developmental goals continue to be important. Today we'll talk about and focus on six key developmental goals, including well-being, leadership and contribution, belonging, purpose, identity and meaning making, and agency and decision making. And in a little bit, I'll tell you about how the brain supports each of these developmental goals. These goals are super important for the development of the, of the developing adolescent and young person. These developmental goals are not a luxury, they're not an add-on. In fact, they're the bare minimum necessary for young people to thrive. And so I invite us today to think about how we can work together to promote um, an environment and systems that promote equitable and healthful development for all young people. We know that um, these, um, that, that, uh, that supporting these systems includes safe schools and online spaces perhaps creating environmentally healthy neighborhoods, and systems of care that center long-term connectedness for the young people entrusted to them. I'll give you a few examples of where developmental science has informed policy in really effective ways um, and, and relevant to these goals. One is in considering the well-being and health of young people. There's a rich literature showing that as children become adolescents, they continue to need um, a, lot of, of, a lot of sleep. We know that babies need sleep, but so too do adolescents. And based on this research, some school districts have adopted later school start times that allow young people to get more sleep. And the, um, perhaps the, the school district that has provided the greatest data is in Seattle. The Seattle school district moved a school start time an hour later a few years ago. They find that there are gains not just academically, but in the well-being, physical well-being and the mental well-being of young people. We can adopt these policies at the system level, at the state level, but also there's research to suggest that we can make more granular changes even in the classroom. Some science suggests that um, engaging young people in a, in, with an eye towards a sense of belonging, of inclusion, helps them feel more connected to their community and to their school. In some studies, we find that if young people have agency in, um, in, 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 the, in the grading practices or the learning activities that they engage in, they feel more connected to their school. And that translates as they move on through this period of development. I haven't yet touched on perhaps the most important thing that contributes to brain development, and that is lived experience. In this picture you see, um, I like to highlight this picture because it shows a group of adolescents who are all 14 years old and they're all in the eighth grade. But I hope you can see from your seat that there's a lot of variation in terms of racial identity, ethnic identity, religious identity, even physical growth. Because all of these kids are at different developmental pubertal stages in development. And that matters because this, how tall someone is, for example, um, has implications for how they are treated in our society. And so incorporating the lived experience into our policies is really important. And the most effective policies and programs have done just that. I work at the Center for the Developing Adolescent at UCLA, and we collaborate with the National Scientific Council on Adolescence, which is populated by a group of experts all around the country who have expertise in supporting adolescent and youth development. We recently put out a, a report, a council report, that examined the intersection of adolescent development and lived experience, and in particular, racism and anti-black racism. What the report shows is that social structures and systems can facilitate adolescent development. It could also be an impediment to adolescent development within certain conditions. That cultural practices support brain development, and having a strong sense of cultural identity and value can, can, can provide a sense of belonging. And finally, that racism, bias, and discrimination can create barriers to healthy development. And this is because the brain regions that respond and are sensitive to a past history of bias and racism and discrimination are on high alert in particular contexts. The brain regions that respond to stress um, include a region called the hippocampus. It releases extra cortisol when we are in context in which we don't feel completely safe. 
And cortisol can be helpful in some situations, but it also can be an impediment to learning and to growth in this region called the hippocampus. I've, oh, let me see if this video is gonna work. Nope, okay, we'll go back. This image is embedded within the developmental goals that we're gonna talk about today because it showcases the connectivity that happens during adolescence. You may know that the brain is highly plastic during this period of life. As I mentioned before, it is responsive to the world and incorporates um, inputs in order to develop new skills. One of the key developmental goals of the brain during adolescence is to strengthen connections within the brain. The pathways that you see here illustrate pathways between, for example, the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which you may know is, um, is what helps us set goals and make decisions and have a sense of agency. It is strengthening connections with other regions of the brain, including the hippocampus, as I mentioned, is important for learning, for regions important for motivation or reward. And so during this last stretch of brain development, that is adolescence and young adulthood, we have the um, opportunity to support and bi-directionally interact between what's happening in the brain and what's happening in the environment. So all of these developmental goals influence the, the connectivity that happens during adolescence and in turn, the connectivity is able to, to support these developmental goals. Brain development science has had, is starting to make inroads in impacting policy and programs. And it has perhaps had the most impact on the juvenile justice system. Um, and thinking about how we can better build um, policies that are um, reflective of what we know is happening in the brain. I'll highlight just one example of that. Um, exactly a month ago, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled against life without the possibility of parole for emerging adults. Emerging adults here are defined as people who were sanctioned or convicted or sentenced to a crime when they were 18, 19, or 20 years old. Um, this ruling reflects a significant shift in the legal treatment of emerging adults in the criminal justice system. And I highlight it here because the opinion of the Supreme Court was largely based on a comprehensive review of research on brain development. They brought in experts to describe what is so special about adolescence and why this is a really important opportunity that we must seize to be reflective of the lived experience and what we know is happening developmentally. This is a landmark decision in part because it honors the science that shows that plasticity equals possibility. And it is personally important to me because I was honored to be one of those expert witnesses to say that adolescence is an important time in life, that plasticity doesn't end earlier in life, and that the systems in which young people engage in, that the lived experience of young people is reflective in their future selves and development. So as we consider all of these different um, youth goals that we aim to achieve, and the systems reflected here in this room today, I'll end with a quote that I think you heard last night, which um, recognizes that there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. It's just a reminder that if we examine these issues in a, from a siloed perspective, we'll never honor the, um, the entire um, uh, adolescent and holistically address the issues that are important to young people. Thank you. I look forward to a generative conversation.